Well, first off, if you, if you don't know who I am, I'm Kevin Hicks. I'm the next-gen pastor here at Church in the Country. Uh, normally on Sundays, I'm upstairs with all our country kids and uh, having a blast with those guys. And uh, then every Wednesday night, we fill this place with 50 to 60 youth. And uh, so I get to bring the word to them on, on Wednesday nights. And, and like Becky said, man, man, our youth ministry has really come a long way since last February. Uh, man, I, I remember when, when I first started as the youth pastor and, and working with them, we had about 10 on Wednesdays. And we used YouTube videos for worship. And uh, now we have our own band up there. Yeah. I mean, it, it is awesome to watch these kids just grow and, and worship God and lead one another that way. I mean, it, it, is, it is truly amazing. Uh, but I told Jordan I wanted to speak today. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't sure. I knew God was leading me to speak and, and had a word that he wanted me to share. I wasn't quite sure exactly what it was yet. And uh, thankfully, uh, through lots of prayer and quiet time on my own, I kind of figured it out. I, I listened and, and said, yeah, all right, if that's what you want, then that's what, that's what we're given today. But uh, before I get too far into this, you know, for the last several weeks, we've been doing a sermon series with our youth. And if you're doing cameras, I'm going to apologize. I move a lot. Uh, we've been doing a sermon series with the youth called Consistency in the Chaos. And when I first began that series, it was very similar to today. I, I honestly didn't have a clue where God was leading me with it. And uh, I didn't realize the topics that we were going to be discussing but without much research, I knew that the world we live in right now is pretty chaotic. And I've told the youth several times, actually, I don't envy them. Man, I, I know that, that the world was hard, I thought, growing up. Nothing like it is now. Man, Satan has, has really given, we, we, Satan has so many doorways to enter our life now. And these teenagers are like right at the beginning of seeing all that. But as I was, pre as I was preparing for this series, I, I went, I took to the World Wide Web with my master's in Google. Yeah. Yes, man, it's something I, I, I hold dear. If I, if I could, I'd put it up on the wall. Yeah. But I took to the web and I went looking for statistics on our youth and the world that we live in today. And if, if you know me the way my wife does, I, I can get off into a squirrel moment real quick. And I'll start looking at statistics that I just find really interesting and has nothing to do with what I'm searching for. And I'll, just, I'll chase that rabbit all the way down the hole. And I found some that are pretty crazy and and some would argue to be pointless, but as a next-gen pastor, I think these are extremely important and interesting to know. Things like, uh, did you know that the human eye can blink an average of 4.2 million times a year? I mean, that's crazy. And uh, now you're sitting there trying to count it. I did. Or how about the average person eats approximately 1,500 pounds of food every single year? Every seven minutes, Walmart generates $3 million in revenue. I found this one interesting because that's like the Tyler County Mall. In a game of bridge, this one was crazy. In a game of bridge, there are exactly 6, or 6, 635,013,559,599 possible hands. Now, I don't even know how to play bridge. But it was still entertaining to know that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Driving 55 miles per hour instead of 65 miles per hour can increase your gas mileage by roughly 15%. Now, that one's pretty interesting because with the way gas prices are right now, I'm sure my wife's going to make me drive home slower. Yeah. But then you can get into some more serious things. Things like every year, approximately 10 people are killed by a vending machine. Wow. That'll make you ponder. Yeah. 
An average of 100 people this year are going to choke on a ballpoint pen. Thankfully, that's not a habit that I have. In in American emergency rooms, over 6,000 people are checked into the hospital for injuries involving a pillow. I thought hard on this one, and I really think that's probably wife-inflicted. That it wasn't clarified. But over 50,000 people each year are injured by jewelry. Now, men, this one's... This is good to know. So the next time that you get a gift and it's not jewelry, just let her know, hey, I'm protecting one of us. Flowers is the safer option. But this morning's message that I'd like to call stopping the statistics, I'm going to challenge you to do just that. And I'm not talking about the statistics that we've already talked about, because whether you believe it or not, you can't just quit blinking. You can keep a safe distance from vending machines, but you can't stop blinking. But the statistics I'm talking about stopping this morning are some that I came, some of the ones that I was actually looking for and and personally found to be disturbing and scary for our future. Certain ones like this. Two studies conducted by both the Barna Group and U.S. Today found that 75% of Christian young adults leave the church after high school. 75%. A Lifeway Christian Resource Survey from 2007 indicated that 70% of 18 to 22-year-olds stop attending church for at least one year. Another survey by the Barna Group has repeatedly shown that a majority of 20-year-olds leave the church and never return. 25% of 18 to 29-year-olds believe that church demonizes everything outside of church, including movies, music, culture, and technology. Things that their generation has come to be defined by. 20% of young adults say that God is absent from their church experience. 25% 25 of young adults say that faith is irrelevant. 33% of young adults say that church is boring. And ultimately, 40 to 50% of young Christians fail to stick with their faith and connect with the church after high school. No matter whose numbers you want to follow or you want to believe in or what statistics, I think we can all agree on one thing. There is a significant exodus happening in the church today. Particularly during the years that take place in the late teens and early 20s where crowds of people who have previously claimed to have a relationship with Jesus are now stepping completely away from him. See, these numbers may not shock you, they may not surprise you, but they should at the very least bother you. I mean, when I read these, it it was bothersome. These numbers should cause you to ask big questions like, what do youth ministries need to change? What do kid ministries need to alter? What do Christian parents need to do differently? What do pastors, leaders, and volunteer helpers need to do in order to reverse the trend that is swiping across the world right now? Now, what would you say if I said that you could help in this? What would you say if I told you that you have a vital role to play? What would you say if I told you that you personally and specifically you yourself could stop the statistics? We're going to start in Deuteronomy 6. I want to read this real quick. Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. 
Tie these symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your house and on your gates. So this is one of the most significant passages in the, Old, in the entire Old Testament, and it's called the Shema, which in Hebrew means to hear. Something that we need to hear and actually understand. And this is even a daily prayer recited by the followers of Judaism because of its incredible importance. And in fact, Jesus himself emphasizes this passage during his ministry on earth, and you can find that in Mark 12. 28 through 30. But I begin with this passage because of one simple reason. As parents, we were called by God to be the primary spiritual advisors, nurturers, and guides for our children. Not the pastor, not the youth pastor, not the children's pastor, not the volunteers, but the parents. And in terms of teaching children the faith and helping youth develop a lifelong faith that will last, the responsibility falls first onto the shoulders of the parents. And I could, I could go a lot into this and say more on it, but we're going to leave that for a Jordan topic. I, I'm going to keep going a little further. But now that we've looked at the Shema as a foundation, I want to press on to see how we, and when I say we, I mean, each and every one of us can stop the statistics that say most of our children, that our youth and our students will turn their backs on God at some point in their life. I'm going to go through three of these pretty quick. Matthew 21, 12 through, 12 through 16. And it says, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, the scripture declares my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The leading priest and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indigenous. They said, Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. And then we can continue into Psalms 8. And it says, O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. And then Mark 10, 13. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering them. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Do not stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms placed his hands on their heads, and blessed them. You know, I wanted to read these passages this, this morning as a quick way of making sure that we all understand something. Because this part, he got to understand. Jesus loves children. Amen. Jesus loves the youth. Jesus loves the next generation. And if you're, if you're like me, he's not talking about the original Star Trek cast. He's talking about the next generation of the church. Amen. Have you ever noticed that several times in the gospel, wherever Jesus was, children was not far away. 
I mean, anytime Jesus wanted to use a child for a sermon analogy, he didn't have to go searching high and low. He didn't have to go ask one of his disciples, go get your son, bring him back so I can teach. And while you do that, I'm going to entertain the crowd with fish and bread. No, all he had to do was reach his arm out and a child was there. Children longed to touch Jesus and receive a touch from him. Children shouted out his praise even when his mature spiritual leaders thought that they had better stay quiet. Jesus absolutely loved the children. Mark 18, 1 through 6. Lots of scripture. I love scripture, guys. About the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among him. When he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like this little, become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. And if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it'd be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. I mean, these are some pretty strong words from Jesus. Not only in regard to our need to be humble and, and for us to approach God as children, but because Jesus says that every time you receive a child in his name, you are receiving Jesus. When you show acceptance for a child, when you come alongside a family and help them find their way towards Jesus, you are displaying your deep love for God. And if we move just a few verses down, you'll see that Jesus says this in, in verse 10. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly father. Man, it's easy to look at these verses from Matthew's gospel and conclude we're all innocent. Because we've never intentionally tempted a child to sin. We've never willingly placed that stumbling block in front of him. I mean, seriously, if you did that, how big of a creep would you have to be? I mean, just, to, hey, there you go. No. But when you see this phrase Jesus uses, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. The word despise could also be worded as see that you not devalue, see that you not disesteem or think little of these little ones. And I wonder how little we must think of the children and our youth and the church and the community to see the significant number of youth and children leaving the church and do nothing about it besides say, I hope their parents raise them, raise them right. I hope that the pastor gets better at discipling those, those young adults. I hope the children pastor can, can teach some sense into my little Johnny. Man, I would strongly suggest to you that while we have already discussed it, discussed that it's inarg inarguably the role of the parent to take the predominant role as a spiritual leader for their children, if you believe that's 100% somebody else's responsibility, then you're thinking little of the children and the youth who are sitting around you this very Sunday. I mean, if you look around, this room is full of them. And Jesus doesn't exactly paint a nice picture for those who want to live that way. I, 
I believe it actually had something to do with wearing a large stone around your neck, like a, a necklace, which leads me back to that one statistic I thought about at the very beginning, jewelry injuries. And so it is my hope and prayer this morning that you would not merely hear what I have to say, but that you would perhaps for the very first time realize that you have a scriptural responsibility to help the children and the youth that are here. Every year, countless Christian teenagers graduate from high school. They graduate from youth group, and with all intents and purposes, they graduate from the church, and they graduate from their faith. And it's within your power to stop these statistics. One of the best ways to help a student develop a lifelong faith is to simply worship beside them. In a church setting, connect with God together. Model for them the relationship with Jesus that is vibrant and alive. And they will begin to notice it and want it for themselves. Show them what it looks like to worship God through music, prayer, scripture, generosity, kindness, love, and so much more. So that's the good news. Here's the bad. There's a lot of churches that are absolutely lousy at accepting children and teenagers. They're too loud. They're rowdy. They make too much of a mess. They're disrespectful. They're a burden on the church. Let me tell you something. That was me. I didn't grow up in church. I was that disrespectful, lousy teenager. There was one youth leader named Zach that was able to look past all that in a little church in Fort Worth, Texas, who had an outreach program designed just for us. We got to go play on a skate park and listen to the word for 15 minutes. That one volunteer who took the time to build a relationship with me, who took the time to ask me how my week was, who took the time to stop the statistics that were going on then, and those statistics are nothing like they are now. I get it. I was a teenager, and now I'm blessed to be the father of three of them. I know how teenagers are. I got a granddaughter, so I even know what it's like to have the little one. They can be a lot. They can be a handful. But then there's this. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of heaven. So obviously, the question that we need to answer is what can we do? And I hope that by now you're not only asking what can the pastor do, what can Kevin do as the youth leader, what can the kids leaders do at all the events, what sort of program can we develop to fix this? I hope that you're asking instead, what can I do? What can I do so that the child who sat in front of me this Sunday morning Worshiping doesn't have those statistics stacked against them. That instead the cards are in their favor. What can I do so that the you sitting in the sanctuary or up on the balcony don't run away from their faith when high school is over? What can I do to stop the statistics? I want to end our time together today by encouraging you to imagine what this could look like in your life. What could happen if you simply introduced yourself to a teenager who came to church this Sunday? What would happen if you partnered alongside a 
parents and started inviting them out for lunch. Somebody that you haven't ever gone to lunch with before. Just so that you could share your love and what Jesus has done with that family. What would happen if you invited families out to your house and when they said, well, hold on, let me find somebody to watch the kids, you said, no, bring them. It's okay. Let them run. How would our church be different if we stopped thinking that we need one youth leader who's willing to be present for every 10 youth on Wednesday night, but instead we need five adults who are willingly and encouraging every one student throughout the course of the week. How would this community be different if children knew that they were being prayed for because you regularly ask them how you can pray for them? How would the city of Woodville, Chester, Warren, Comus Nell, or even Texas, just Texas in general, and the United States change if you connected and contacted with the students from this church, the ones that just graduated, went off to college, and said, hey, Jesus loves you, so do I. What can I pray, be praying for you for? Man, our country, our planet, the population in heaven would be so much different. We may not be able to stop everyone from walking away from their faith. I mean, let's face it, even Jesus had people turn their backs on them. But you can plant that seed. You can be building that foundation that when later in life, they run back to. What if you're willing to partner with kid ministries, youth ministries, and most importantly, families to stack the deck and encourage lifelong faith in the lives of the few within our reach. Are you willing to take a minute, just right now, here in just a moment, to pray that God would lead you into the life of a child, a teenager, or a family so that you can intentionally and practically come alongside their parents and help nurture a faith that will never fail and that will last beyond high school. I don't know what it's going to look like for you. I don't know what God's going to call you to do. It might be volunteering at vacation Bible school. It might be coming up and and helping with youth on Wednesday nights. It might be helping with country kids on Sunday mornings or being in the nursery for just one Sunday a month. Maybe God's calling you just to go upstairs before service and play with the kids and show them your love and your joy just at the air hockey table. But God has given us a scriptural responsibility to lead these young lives To him. I don't know where God's calling you, but are you willing to listen and do your part to stop the statistics that are against each and every young life in this world? God gave it to you. If you would, just bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come to you seeking your guidance, your strength. Lord, your word has has told us numerous and numerous times that you love these children. That you love the youth and the next generation and that it is our job to teach them and to raise them in your word. God, today we come to you just asking that you'll show us 
what that looks like in each and every one of our lives. Lord, I just pray that you will give us that distinct, that distinct knowledge of what you want us to do. Maybe it's volunteering. Maybe it's just inviting that family next to us to lunch and getting to know them. But whatever it is, we know that is part of your word and our responsibility. Lord, we thank you for each and everything that you've done for us. And we thank you for each and every one of these children and these youth. I know I'd love seeing them all here. I love hearing those little voices fill the church, hearing their footsteps through the hallways and on the on the balcony. Because each time I hear a new step, I know it's a new life that is joining us in heaven. We thank you for all this. And in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.